Father, if we walk out of here in an hour or so and, and a man pulls a knife on us and takes our wallet like we read about on the NPR website today, I bet we do what Mr. Diaz did and offer him our coat because it might be chilly as he robs people the rest of the night and blow him away for Christ. Or if we get home and feel some awful, strange, jagging pain, and tomorrow the doctor tells us it's very serious, I pray that we wouldn't waste our cancer. So Father, I pray that whatever will befall us in these next hours, that we wouldn't waste it. You write the script, grant that we would respond in a way that makes Jesus look more valuable than our wallets and more valuable than our health. So draw near now, I pray, and grant me your help. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So why do we do these regional conferences? We do a couple of these a year. We'll go to Austin, I think, this fall, Austin, Texas, and talk about Job. Here's the reason. This is 1 John 1. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you, so that your fellowship might be with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. I write these things to you or I visit you and I speak to you in order that my joy might be full. So there it is. I'm coming to make me see happy. I'm coming to be happy. Now if that sounds selfish to you, um, ask yourself this question. Do I feel more loved when somebody tries to help me flourish because it makes them happy to make me flourish? Or do I feel more loved when Somebody tries to help me flourish because there's a law that says they're supposed to and they're doing their moral duty. A woman is in the hospital. Let's flesh this out just a little more. A woman is in the hospital. She's old. I use old people because they, they always respond this way. Young people tend not to. You should learn from old people like this. Old people... I get the call that Ellen is in the hospital and it's serious, they don't know what it is, they rushed her in there and she's 80 and, and so I go, not altogether enthusiastic, I was playing with my little girl, it's playtime, and uh, praying all the way there that the Lord would change my heart, that I would be a caring, loving shepherd and regularly he does it in the elevator. Or, or as the door opens and there she is, a real, live human being on the brink of eternity. And I walk in and her eyes are closed and I put my hand on her hand and, and she wakes up, opens her eyes, she sees who it is. And this is what old people do. She says, oh pastor, you shouldn't have come. You're so busy. You didn't need to come. Now at that moment, how would you feel if I said, I know I didn't need to come and I didn't want to come and the only reason I'm here is because I'm a pastor and I'm supposed to. <laughs> We're all laughing now at this glorious thing called duty. Why? Why? You really need to know why you laugh. It's very profound. It's very profound. 
No, that's not what I say. I say, Ellen, I know I didn't have to come. But when I walked through that door and saw you here, my heart welled up so much in desire for you to be blessed by my prayer and what God might be pleased to do. There's no place on the planet I'd rather be than right here with you. Now that's a very selfish thing to say. There's no place I'd rather be on the planet than right here with you. And not in a million years is she going to say, that's all you ever think about, Pastor, is yourself. <laughs> because there is something profound about finding your delight in blessing other people. It's not selfish. It's called love. That's what love is. So... When I say that the reason we do these regional conferences is to proclaim what we have seen and heard, that your fellowship might be with us and ours is with the Father and with the Son. I write these things, I say these things to you, I'm standing here that my joy might be full. I hope you feel loved. What God might be pleased to do here by His Word would make me very happy. And I have ideas of what I want him to do here. I'll be praying about them along the way, and you'll be hearing them along the way, and if God would be pleased to inform me in five or ten years that some of them happened, then my joy would abound. So there's the root reason why we do these conferences. My mission in life, the mission statement of our church, the mission statement of Desiring God Ministries, all the same. You know, when you stay at a place 28 years and you have a ministry for 12 or 15 years, mission of pastor and mission of people all kind of merge into one. And so everybody at Bethlehem could recite what I'm about to recite. I exist to spread a passion now in slow, I exist to spread a passion for the supremacy of God in all things, for the joy of all peoples through Jesus Christ. So that's why I'm here. If God would be pleased to use this mouth, and these thoughts, and His Word coming through all of that, to spread a passion here so that you come in with your passion for Him languishing or non-existent, you go away red hot. That's why I'm here. I would like to stoke the fire of whatever little, little flame might be in your heart. That's why we go around doing these things. Most recently, I think it was, uh, I don't know, yesterday or the day before, in my Bible reading, I'm at Psalm Night, uh, Psalm 71, and every, every time I get to Psalm 71 in my through the Bible in a year, I pause at verse 18 and rememorize it because I'm getting older and older and older. And Psalm 71, 18 says, Even to old age and gray hairs, O God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation your power to all those who are to come. So I'm asking the Lord, let me to another generation. And I, I don't know how long those another's might last. I don't know how you count generations. It might be 20 years, or it might be, say, college generations, like four years. And I just want another one, Lord. While I'm breathing, I want another one. I want to lift up Christ in His majesty for another one as long as you Give me breath. So that's why we are here. Now the focus of this one is don't waste your life. A little autobiography there. Some of this is in the book. My dad is an evangelist. He is in heaven right now. He died last year on March 6th. That means I grew up in a home where heaven and hell were very real. My father really believed in them, and he really believed you either went to the one, heaven, 
or you went to the other hell and totally wasted your eternity. And I grew up in the frightening atmosphere of that division of humanity. It weighed upon him and it weighed upon me as a child. And to this day I carry that weight because I believe just like he did that in this room there are two kinds of people, hell bound and heaven bound. Either you'll waste your entire eternity in hell or you will prosper in heaven. So he preached and I listened whenever I traveled with him. And he would tell stories in his preaching and the one that I remember most vividly concerning this is he would come home on a Monday we would have dinner together and he would tell the triumphs of the gospel and tell his latest jokes and the story this time was that an, an old man had been prayed for in the church for years and years maybe 25 and he was old and people didn't know if he would be an unbeliever until he died and thus perish or if God might be pleased to save him and they were praying earnestly that my dad's ministry might be the instrument of the Holy Spirit to save him and on the last night of the crusade this old man walked to the front and people were absolutely astonished and thrilled he sat down weeping on the front pew my dad dismissed the service <clears throat> and went to sit beside him shared the gospel more fully the man professed faith in Christ kept weeping and my dad just waited to listen and what came out of his mouth over and over and over as an old man was I wasted it I wasted it I wasted it my dad would tell that story to me again and again as a little boy I don't know how it happened that and many other things it just ingrained in me I don't want to waste my life I don't want to waste my life. I want my life to count for whatever lives are supposed to count for. Don't let me throw this away. It was there. I, I dug into, when I was writing the book, I, I dug into my old little archives from high school and little things that were left in file folders all tucked away that I hadn't looked at for years and years. And I turned up the senior high literary magazine from 1964 Wade Hampton High School Greenville South Carolina and lo and behold I had a poem in it I'd forgotten about that it was not a good poem <laughs> but it had a theme that moved me deeply the name of the poem in this magazine called leaves of grass was called the lost years so here I am 17 years old writing these lines Long I sought for the earth's hidden meaning. Long as a youth was my search in vain. Now as I approach my last year's waning, my search, I must begin again. Why would I write that? <laughs> Why was this so in me? Thinking of a life of futile searching starting over again as an old man but whatever the reason there it was and here I am at age 62 saying the same thing again and burdened that the last chapter of my life not be wasted and feeling very much at age 62 more vulnerable to wasting it than I ever have because when you get old you get tired more easily and the couch starts to feel really good <laughs> we bought a new leather couch and the salesman said even with shorts on the leather changes to skin temperature in 11 seconds <laughs> so and you kind of nestle down into it you're like this feels really good i could just spend all night here that's scary to me. It's very scary to me. Because old people start to justify that. They do. 
Well, I put in my time, get my 65 years or 62 years or whatever, and now I, I do couch time, <laughs> especially by a lake or a sea, wherever it is. <laughs> there was in our kitchen, and now it's in my study, so it's very old, a plaque, green glass painted, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Hung there over the sink all my growing up years. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only what's done for Christ will last. Now it, it's up over the window just to my right, to the right of my desk, still reminding me. I have a fear of wasting my life and I have a passion that my life count. Now there's a massive assumption behind that fear and that passion. A massive assumption, I need to state it, clarify it, maybe put just a little bit underneath it, but I'm just, I'm just gonna call it an assumption and uh, you may or may not share it. The assumption is this, there is a reason, a purpose, a why to your life that you did not create but was given to you sovereignly. There is a reason or a purpose or a why for your life you did not create. Now that's a huge assumption. I went off to college, Wheaton College, and uh, these are 64 to 68 of my college these are, these are radical years, right? Mini skirts, armbands, bare feet, marching in the streets, anti-war, pro-racial justice. These were mega significant years. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. Existentialism, that was the red hot thing then, Camus, Sartre, Nietzsche, God is dead, April 8, 1966, cover of Time magazine, Is God Dead? Interviews with Altizer, who I heard John Warwick Montgomery debate at the University of Chicago, Is God Dead? The meaning of Is God Dead was has he become so absolutely and totally unthinkable as a reality and irrelevant as a reality that he makes zero difference in determining what wasted lives are? Now, so here I am, I'm a lit major, I'm discovering thinking and literature and philosophy and anthropology and history and everything's exploding. I love those days. And I couldn't buy it. I couldn't buy existentialism. Here's the key phrase to define what existentialism was. It's just another form of postmodernism. If you know that phrase, then there's, there's a lot of overlap. Existentialism said, existence before essence. Existence is where you get the word existentialism, existencism, Exist existence before essence, meaning there is no ultimate reality, there is no objective, firm reality outside of yourself defining your essence which you should bring your existence into conformity with to find meaning. See that pattern? That's historic Christian pattern. There is, an, uh, there is a reality outside of you. It defines your essence to find your meaning in life and not waste it. You bring your existence into conformity to the given essence defined by God. Now existentialism turned that totally around and said there isn't any of that out there. It's all in here. You create your own existence and thus project the essence that is. And that's what people believe today by and large too. I couldn't buy it. It all went hand in hand with naturalistic evolution. And the reason I couldn't buy it is because in my darkest and my happiest hours, my joy, my sorrow, 
my anger, my indignation. I could not reduce to chemicals on a par with a spider's instinct to build a beautiful web. I couldn't. There were low moments when I tried. Be brave, be radical, be an unbeliever. And I would look at the implications of it for the meaning of the human being. And it became so absolutely absurd, the theater of the absurd became so absurd, I just was protected. It was grace. I was protected from it. Even the most difficult problems affected me upside down from the way they affected so many of my throw it all away peers. For example, the problem of evil, the problem of suffering. Bart Ehrman, professor at the University of North Carolina, has written numerous books recently. He's not a believer. He went to Wheaton College with me, not with me, but after me. Went to Moody Bible Institute, then went to Princeton Seminary, became a pastor, and then he threw it all away. And now he's writing books to persuade the rest of us to join him in his courage to throw it all away. One of them, the most recent one, is called God's Problem. I wrote down the subtitle. There it is. How the Bible fails to answer our most important question, why we suffer. He's got over 200 pages on the failure of the Bible to answer that question. Now, so here I am as a 18, 19, 20, 20, 22 year old looking existentialism in the face saying there's no meaning out there, there's no objective reality, there's nothing out there that defines your existence and gives it to you and you conform with it. You, you are totally, frighteningly free because you are just part of an endless spiral of evolutionary forces of matter and energy and time becoming whatever that wills. And I looked at that and I thought, if that's true, what becomes of evil? So here you are, you're contemplating the Holocaust and the horrors, the absolute unspeakable horrors of man doing to man. And you watch some people look at those horrors and throw God away and say, there cannot be a God in view of those horrors. And then you, you watch another kind of person. This is, this is what happened to me who looked at those, and everything in you said, wrong, evil, wicked, unjust. And then it hits you. Those words have no meaning at all if I am a collection of chemicals. None. It's like a headache. Your moral outrage at the injustices you see in the world is a headache. Get over it. If they're not rooted in something besides the synapses of your brain. So you see, there was no way out for me. God had me trapped. Everywhere I looked, I saw, you can't let him go. If you let him go, you don't buy anything that works. There was nothing to be preferred. And so, I was shut up to Jesus. So as I come to you, and I'm asking, what, what is the wasted life? Or what is the unwasted life? From early on, for me it was six. It was settled. That will be dictated for me from outside. I won't make it up. I won't make it up. I tried and tried to think you could make up things and be more free and more real and more authentic and have more meaning and it all collapsed like a house of cards. 
I will be defined by absolute reality. For me, I will be defined by Jesus Christ, His Father, the Spirit, the Word of God. And today, as I've, I've year after year, decade after decade, revisited the ground and the foundation of that, I've never been able to shake him loose. Jesus Christ won me over. The Apostle Paul won me over. I came to trust the Apostle Paul. This may sound strange to you to come at Christianity this way. Paul wrote, what, 13 letters? I read them as a child and teenager and college student hundreds of times. Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus. I read them hundreds of times. And then he said things like this. By him, by Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things. And you just reel back. Paul, Jesus Christ created the universe and He created it for Himself? Yes. Now, you just have to decide at that moment, is this guy wacko? Is he a lunatic? Is he deceived? Or is he a Christ-encountering, authorized truth-teller about ultimate reality? You know, you've, you've read C.S. Lewis and the other authors who use the argument, liar, lunatic, or lord. Ever heard that argument, liar, lunatic? It's an excellent argument, I think. Jesus is either a liar, or he's a lunatic, or he's who he says he is, he's the Lord. I used it for Paul. It just worked for Paul. And it was more intimate for me for Paul. He's a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's an authorized apostle. I cannot read Romans and say, that's a lunatic. I can't read Colossians. I can't read 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. And say, this man's lost his marbles. There's nobody more real than the Apostle Paul beside Jesus Christ. I, I have never read anybody like the Apostle Paul. He wins me. I mean, how are you going to decide what happened 2,000 years ago? You weren't there and neither was any video team. <laughs> All you've got is witnesses, more or less close whose documents were handed down. You're just going to totally throw up your hands on the most important matters in the world. No, you're not. You're going to take these documents, like 13 letters, half of them, the most liberal scholars in the world, think Paul wrote. So let's just take that half. Okay? Romans and Galatians. Let's leave it at that. Everybody in the planet thinks Paul wrote Romans and Galatians. And then you've got to decide, is this witness the witness of a fool, liar, deceiver? I couldn't. I couldn't go there. And then I turned to Jesus, and he says things like, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> and, you know, Lewis said, either he is. Or he's a, he thinks he's a poached egg. <laughs> he's like a lunatic who's going around the neighborhood saying, I'm a poached egg. Sizzle, sizzle. <laughs> Prick me, I bleed yellow. That is, in fact, what that statement would be if it weren't true. Is that your opinion of Jesus? He's like a lunatic who believes he's a poached egg. The high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven in power and great glory. <laughs> he said that. Blood running down his face. Spit dripping from him. 
bruises, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. I'm a lunatic, a lunatic to the end. Or my Savior and my God. So when I come to you posing the question, what is a wasted life? You may have a thousand ways of answering that question. I don't know how you answer it. My way to answer it is I'm going to Jesus and I'm going to Paul and I'm going to the wider biblical testimony that they have credited and I'm going to get my answer there and stake my life on it. So that's what I'm going to share with you is why do we exist? What does a life that counts look like? What's the purpose for our existence? So let me tell you where we're going in this message. This is all introduction so far. <laughs> this message has a title. The two tomorrow have titles and here are the titles and where we're going. The title of this message is The Essence of the Unwasted Life. What is the ultimate aim of the life that truly counts? So essence, mark that word. Second, tomorrow morning will be the origin of the unwasted life. What must happen for such a life to be lived? Origin, where does it come from? And third, the appearance of the unwasted life. What does it look like? And so if you hear it, we're moving from uh, theoretical to practical. We're moving from weighty to uh, hands-on, nitty-gritty, everyday. Don't waste your robbery. Don't waste your cancer. Don't waste your sexuality. Don't waste your singleness. Don't waste your marriage. Don't waste your affliction. Don't waste your youth. Don't waste your retirement. Those kinds of questions in the third message, Lord willing, tomorrow. So here we are with the essence of the unwasted life. Jesus and Paul both believed there was such a thing as a wasted life. I'm going to give you examples, two examples, one from Jesus, one from Paul, a wasted life. So this is just one, there are many, but you get the flavor, because I want you to see they really do believe that you can waste your life. If you're a total relativist, you don't. Because what's good for you is good for you. Wasted life would imply some standard of measurement. And Jesus and Paul really believe in such a standard of measurement. I hope you do. Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. This is Luke 12. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. He thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. And God said to him, fool. I don't know if he used that tone of voice. <laughs> Fool, this night your soul is required back. Now there's a word there in Greek that implies it was on loan to you and you messed it up big time. I gave you the soul for a purpose and I'm taking it back, fool. Now, the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. We'll talk about Monday in the third, I mean, we'll talk about money in the third message. So there's a wasted life. Relax, eat, drink, be happy. Just ordinary. Nothing wicked, right? He's not killing anybody, stealing, doing drugs, getting drunk. He's just being happy, eating and drinking and 
sitting on his pile. Paul believed in the unwasted life. He said it in a frightening way. I think about this a lot. This is 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only, mark this, if in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. You get what that's saying? If there is no resurrection of the dead, the life that I have chosen to live is ridiculous. Not many American Christians can say that. Scary text. Most of us would say, well, I suppose if I died in 70 years and went to judgment and found out there's nothing there. And neither am I. I never even woke up. If you could wake up and pass judgment on your life, you'd probably say, that's pretty good. Pretty good life. Would you say, what a stupid mistake. I wasted it. Paul is saying to be a Christian is foolish and pitiable and wasted if there's no resurrection. He said, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. But there is a resurrection, and therefore the shape of love in this life looks different than if there were no rewards. You've all studied heaven with Randy Alcorn. I love Randy Alcorn. Randy's radical. He gets it. Okay, what's the essence of the unwasted life? I'm taking you to Philippians chapter 1. If you want to go there with me in a Bible, that's where, that's the most important text that I'll share with you in the whole three hours together. For Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Paul says this, this text is just huge for me. I preached it in Bethlehem 28 years ago when I candidated. It has been a pole star in my heaven of texts for years and years and to this day exerts on me a huge emotional effect for numerous reasons. I'll just read two verses. This is verse 20. In 21 of Philippians chapter 1, Paul says, stating his life mission, It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but, alternative to shame, that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be, how should we translate that next word? ESV, honored, magnified, made much of megalun thesetai megalun or you can you can hear even the mega part in in greek mega it means i want no matter what in my body whether by life or by death that christ would be made to look great that's the unwasted life you and I are on this planet for a few years, all for the same ultimate reason in many various forms. And the ultimate reason is that we might so live and so die that Christ would be made to look valuable as he really is. Psalm 63 the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. Or if you believe that. 
That's why Paul says in verse 21, because for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. When he says to die is gain, he means that, according to verse 23, dying is going to be far better because he will be at home with Christ, which means Christ is more valuable than anything life can offer, which is what the psalmist said. The steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. Being loved by God and being brought into his fellowship and seeing him face to face is better than anything you could experience on earth. I, I, do not, I do not say this lightly. I was at Pizza Hut dating my little 12 year old girl last Saturday. And I was about to preach an Easter message. And uh, I just looked out the window and wistfully said, I really would like Jesus to come back. I'm not sure why I said it even. I just felt it. Maybe the pressures of Easter and other things that have been going on. And she did not laugh. She did not roll her eyes. She did not. She said very seriously, Daddy, I want to get married. She's 12. <laughs> and I, everything in me said, I totally understand and I totally felt that way. And I don't want her to feel that way. Meaning, not that it's wrong to get married. Meaning, if you knew Talitha, if you knew what it would mean for him to come, if you could transport yourself forward to that moment, you wouldn't feel that way. The only reason you feel that way is because at 12, your imagination is small. And your biblical awareness of the preciousness of Christ is, is small. I believe it's real. I believe my daughter is born again and saved and loves Jesus. But she's honest. <laughs> like a lot of you, if you were honest right now, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say what Paul said here. To live is Christ and to die tonight would be better than anything I could have had over the next 40 years. It's true. It is true. And one of my goals in being here is that you would so know him that you would feel it. Not just read it, but feel it. What a radical people we would be, we Christians, if we totally could be like Paul. My eager expectation and hope now as always is that I might not be ashamed, but now as always Christ might be shown to be infinitely more valuable than anything else. For to me to live is Christ and to die gain. That's what, that's what I want to be. That's what it would mean to have a non-wasted life. Christ to be made much of. So, the essence of the unwasted life is that you will so live your life in the way you handle your money, the way you handle your singleness, the way you handle your marriage, the way you handle your retirement, the way you handle your cancer, the way you handle your robbery. You will handle it in a way that people infer from your life Jesus is more valuable than anything. Jesus looks great. You should be asking yourself, how do I do this so that Jesus looks great? How do I use money so that Jesus looks greater than money? That's the key question. How do I use my house so that it's more plain that Jesus is more precious than my house? More valuable than my house. How do I do my career so that it's plain that Jesus is more precious than my career? How do I handle my body so that it looks obvious that Jesus is more precious? This is not an easy life. Those are hard questions to even understand and then even harder to live. And most American Christians don't even ask them. They just coast right into worldliness along with everybody else. We are to magnify Christ. Like a telescope, 
not a microscope. Magnify. Microscopes make teeny weeny things look bigger than they are. And telescopes make gargantuan things look more like they really are. Which do you do for Jesus? We are telescopes. Somebody sent me a mug about a year ago with a, a telescope on it. And I knew exactly why he had sent me this mug. And it sits on my this thing in front of my desk there to remind me, is today your life functioning like a telescope for somebody? They put their eye to it and they say, Whoa, I didn't know he was that important. That looked like twinkle, twinkle, little star. And it's a galaxy. Not an easy life. It's a miracle life. At the end of the age, we're going to be doing this forever. I heard the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. That's what we're going to say. Forever. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, infinitely worthy, more worthy than any of us collectively can begin to imagine He's worthy to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, <laughs> these are talking animals. <laughs> You're going over this so fast, you ever see that? Let's start over again. And I heard every creature in heaven, on the earth, under the earth, that's worms, and in the sea, that's squid, all of them saying to him who sits upon the throne, to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Squid and worms and frogs and flying creatures saying. Lewis knew what he was doing when he had animals talk. This is eschatological. Just like the rocks are going to cry out in due time, animals are going to cry out in due time. Everything will give vent to the worth of the King of Kings. There will be nothing silent in the universe. Oh, that you might get a head start with your life and your voice. Now, we exist, therefore, to display the glory of Christ, to make Him look great by the way we live and talk and think. The reason for that is that Christ is the ultimate, supreme manifestation of God. He is God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father. From now on, you will know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. And it's enough. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you and you don't know me? <sighs> That's breathtaking. Show you the Father? poached egg or the father in the flesh <coughs> Jesus said to him have you been so long with me and you don't know me in these last days he has spoken to us by a son whom he appointed the heir of all things through whom he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus is speaking the universe into existence every millisecond. If he, if he was silent, there would be no universe. And you would go out of existence, poof, just like that. He holds you in being by the word of his power. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. The reason we exist to display the majesty and the beauty and the worth of Christ is because Christ is God. And He upholds all things, and He created all things, and they all exist to display Him. Everything exists to display Him. The universe exists to make God known. 
The heavens are telling the glory of God. Psalm 19, verse 1. Get the video set, The Earth, or The Blue Planet, and spend eight hours worshiping. Did you know that there's a plant? You won't believe this. I don't believe it. But they said so. National Geographic, except on the issue of evolution, surely doesn't lie. So there's, there's this plant in some jungle somewhere, and, and it flowers, and there's a little pool of poisonous water down there. And little bugs come up over the edge, and at the top here, it's slippery. And they lose their footing and fall in and die. And they feed the plant. Now, that's important. That's, that's interesting. But that's not the interesting thing, ultimately. The interesting thing, ultimately, is that there's a spider who only lives by dropping by his little silver cord down into this and plucking those little dead animals and eating them. Let us all bow down <laughs> and, and worship mindless matter. And, and natural selection and just, I mean, I, I mean, you just need to know where I'm coming from. When we get to the judgment seat, and Mr. Dawkins and Hitchens and 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 they all they say, and God says, now what was that? You said about the way that spider came into being and the way humans came into being, and they said, well, we thought it was just nothing. I mean, just. Just forces that just, that just kind of, it just, you know, happen. And I, I think God's gonna look at me. He's gonna say, <laughs> he's just gonna, he's just gonna laugh, and the universe is gonna shake. I mean, I really, I, I cannot, I cannot take it seriously. I, I know you scientists think. Oh, this guy's so out of touch. I can't. I've tried. I've tried to take it seriously. It is so laughable. Hear it. Write it down, God. Piper said in San Luis Obispo, this thing is so laughable, it takes an absolute believer to embrace it. Well, I don't know how I got on that. I was trying to illustrate that the universe exists to display the glory of God and therefore those who try to give an account for the universe that exists in a non-God way are not only laughable, but they are blasphemous. This is God's story. The heavens are telling the glory of God. Open your ears, he's saying. It is all over the place. And we will give an account of whether we heard that word or saw that glory. This is not fun and games here. This is God speaking to us. You ride this coast. Now, here I am. I'm down at a little hotel about 15 minutes that way. I have a little, I don't know what they call it, cottage inn or something like that. And uh, there's a swimming pool by the ocean. I thought, that is ridiculous. <laughs> that it's it's about you know it's about the size of this stage not quite and I looked I looked at the pool and then I looked up I thought this is man this is a man pool and that's a God pool it's everywhere there are voices everywhere just open your eyes and open your ears and pray for the Holy Spirit to give you a sensitivity of what the wasted life would be. Namely, a life that doesn't see it, a life that doesn't hear it, and a life that isn't shaped by the meaning of the universe to display the glory of God. We are being called to join Him in His own self-glorification. Now, that's, that last statement is controversial 
and I need to support it for just a few minutes. This idea that Paul has that the unwasted life is a life in which he will by life and death make Christ look great because the universe exists to display God through his son. That is not Paul's idea. That's God's idea for Paul, which means it's God's idea for the universe, which means God is very self-exalting. If God comes to you and you say to him, why do I exist? And he says, to make much of me. You're hearing absolute truth. And people really stumble over this truth. You exist to magnify me. Go about it. And I will hold you accountable for whether you've done it or not. Text after text after text. Isaiah 43, 6. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory. God created you for his glory. That is to make him look glorious. He elected Israel for his glory. Jeremiah 13, 11. I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory. He saved them from Egypt. For this same reason, Psalm 106, our fathers rebelled against the Most High at the Red Sea, but he saved them for his namesake that he might make known his power. He rescued them from bondage in uh, Babylon with these words, for my namesake I defer my anger, for the sake of my praise I restrain it for you, for my own sake, for my own sake I do it, how should my name be profane, my glory I will not give to another, and he sends Jesus Christ into the world for the same reason, Romans 15, 7, Christ became a servant to the circumcision to show God's truthfulness and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Christ came to earth that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that the Son may glorify thee. And he's coming back at the end for the same reason. 2 Thessalonians 1. He comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at by all who have believed. He's coming to be glorified. He's coming to be marveled at. This is not Paul's idea, that his life should be defined by living to make much of Christ. This is Christ's design for Christ. This is God's design for Christ. Now, why do I go there? Why don't you, Piper, you just get yourself in trouble when you go there. Why don't you just leave that whole dimension? I mean, those texts that you just rattled off there, there must be 30 or 40 of them in the Bible, way more. Why don't you just leave those aside and say what everybody knows? Namely, Paul wants to be God-centered and Christ-exalting, and that's his duty, and nobody disagrees with that. And so just say that. And I'll tell you why. Saying what people are used to hear changes nobody. And people don't feel how radical this is and how hard it is and how stunning it is that Paul is not being called merely to do a duty. My, my dad and mom quoted 1 Corinthians 10.31 to me hundreds of times. Johnny, whether you eat or whether you drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I knew that's my duty. And it, it did not have the effect that it had when I discovered in 1971, 68, 69, 71, that God does everything for his glory and I am commanded to join him in it. That was like dynamite in my soul and it might be in yours if you can get over the stumbling block that God is so self-exalting and that Christ is so Christ exalting and invites you in to their passion for their glory the discomfort 
in this room with that idea shows how far you are from comprehending, some of you, how radical this is. You're, you're uncomfortable with talking that way. And the Bible talks like that everywhere. God doing things for His glory. Christ doing things for His glory. Christ glorifying God. God glorifying Christ. This intra-Trinitarian conspiracy to magnify each other is everywhere in the Bible. But we live in such an absolutely man-centered world that those things make us creepy crawling. So let me give you five quick reasons for why they have had such an effect upon me to provide booster behind Philippians 120 and 121. Why do you need to even go there, Piper? Why, why do you need to bring up that when Paul says, I want my life to count to magnify Christ, you draw in the fact that this is God's design for him and therefore God's God-centeredness and Christ's Christ-exalting passion are behind it. Why do you go there? And here are five reasons why I go there. Number one, God's unswerving allegiance to his own glory shows how righteous he is and how trustworthy he is and I wouldn't know it any other way Righteousness from God is doing right. What is doing right for a God? He wrote the book. There's no law for God to obey. What does doing right mean for God? What is righteousness in God? And doing right for God means valuing what's valuable, esteeming what's infinitely worthy of esteem, treasuring what is infinitely worthy of being treasured. And what's that? Himself. And if he were to do anything other than value the infinitely valuable, God, treasure the infinitely worthy, God, esteem the infinitely esteem worthy, God, he would be unrighteous, unreliable, untrustworthy, and an idolater to boot. And I don't want a God like that. That's one reason why it makes a huge difference in my life. I want a righteous God. I have to have a righteous God, a just God, a holy God, an infinitely wise, perceptive, knows what is truly valuable type God. Here's the second reason. God's unwavering allegiance to his own glory shows the immeasurable extent of God's happiness. You can't even begin to comprehend how happy God is until you know that he delights in the Son more than he delights in you. The Son of God is the radiance of His glory, the exact imprint of His nature, and He's had Him in His face forever. There has never been a time when God has not been infinitely happy in the fellowship that He has, beholding the array of His perfections in the beauty of His Son. God is like a Vesuvius of joy forever. You can't even get at that without God's passion for God. Third, God's unwavering allegiance to His own glory shows how easily we can be deceived thinking that we love God when in fact we love ourselves more than God. Oh, how deceived we can be. And one of the reasons people get really bent out of shape about this is because they really love themselves and use God. God is not their end. God is a means. You step on God to get to where you want to be. He's useful. Gets rid of my guilt feelings. Gets me out of hell. Gets my sins forgiven. And now I can have eternal, you know, you name your idol. Golf. Sex. Food. Beach. Surfing. Sunshine. Thank you God very much. And you're willing to thank Him forever. As long as He doesn't have to be you're, you're God. He's just useful. Just useful. This, this teaching that God is radically God-centered won't let that stand. It will always say, am I your supreme treasure? Or are you using me to get your supreme treasure? That's number three. Number four may be the most important for getting you over the hump, and I want you to get over the hump. I'm not, easy, I'm not eager to beat you up. I'm eager to get you over a hump here. And here's, here's the biggest hump to get over and, and the way over it. The reason people don't like this teaching about the 
God-centeredness of God and how God-exalting God is and how radically Christ-exalting Christ is is because it simply doesn't sound loving. Love seeks not its own. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. You're telling us God seeks his own all the time. So he's not loving, so you're wrong. Forty texts, be damned. No, here's the answer. This truth that God is constantly, unwaveringly, in all that He does, exalting His Son, magnifying His glory, is vastly more loving than if He devoted Himself to help you like what you see in the mirror. If God were to make himself a means to your self-exaltation, he would be a global distraction from what would make you happy. You know what love is? It's not what the world says it is. The world says, somebody loves me if they make much of me. And that feels so good, it's hard not to believe. Somebody loves me if they make much of me. But in that, in that relationship, you are the end. And he's the means. He makes much of me. That's not what love is in, in the Bible. In the Bible, love labors, sacrifices, and even dies to liberate you from your bondage to the mirror so that you can delight in God forever. You're selling your soul for a bowl of oatmeal when you want God to just meet your earthly needs and call that love. That's not love. Love is when God does that or not in ways that bring you free from your love affair with yourself and free you to enjoy making much of Him forever. You were made to know and love God. You know this is true. You stand by the sea coast. You stand by the edge of the Grand Canyon. You stand with your eye to a telescope, the Hubble telescope pictures or whatever. You stand there and you find your soul drawn out of yourself and for a brief moment you are free from self-consciousness and self absorption and it is the most full satisfying deep wonderful moment and it will be forever if God is the universe and God is the Grand Canyon and God is the ocean that's why you were made God would be unloving if he did not magnify himself in your presence over and over and over if he did not command you to praise me praise me praise me he would not love you if he said I praise you I praise you I praise you he would satisfy that little teeny ego of yours and you would perish and your soul would shrink up like a peach the back of the refrigerator you know that's not what you're made for you're made to know something vastly greater namely God and so he must constantly tell you that he must constantly lift up himself lift up his son and say make much of my son and it will satisfy your soul so this fourth point or fifth point fourth point is that the reason this matters to me is I wouldn't know what love is if I didn't tell you that God was radically God-centered and that this idea that Paul says the unwasted life is the life lived for the glory of Christ is not his idea, it's God's idea, and therefore God is exalting his son. If I didn't tell you that, I wouldn't be able to communicate what love is. Love is God spending himself at the cost of his son's life to free you to enjoy making much of him forever. That's what love is. And that's the way you'll love other people too, but that would say for the third message. The last one, the fifth reason why this matters so much to me, is that um, if I didn't stress and draw attention to the fact that Paul's passion to magnify Christ in his body, whether by life or by death, is really not his idea but God's idea for his son to be magnified and therefore 
God is very Christ-exalting and Christ is joining God in being Christ-exalting and they invite Paul in to be Christ-exalting into this conspiracy of divine self-exaltation. If I didn't draw your attention to that, you wouldn't be able to know that your love for God is not just your love for God, but God's love for God, given by the Holy Spirit, shed abroad in your heart. And I'll tell you why this matters. Once you begin to see how big he is, how glorious he is, how majestic he is, you know what the emotional effect is on your love for him? It's to feel, this is so totally inadequate, I don't think he can even recognize it as love. That's the way I feel most of the time anyway. My heart's response to this God is called love. What will I do if left to myself? What will I do if for all eternity, the emotional, affectional response of joy in the presence of God is something that I can manage and I can produce, and it's not. That's the meaning of the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has always existed between the Father and the Son. He's always carried in His own person the love of the Son for the Father. He's always carried the love of the Father for the Son. The Holy Spirit is the love of God, standing forth as a real person, and He moves in on you. And Jesus says, I will send my Holy Spirit, and He will glorify me. That's the mission of the Holy Spirit in your life. You, you are not left to yourself with this huge burden of knowing and enjoying and delighting in and loving God. It's the Holy Spirit coming on you and moving into you, flexing His arms and saying, I will now be this for you. Listen to this word from uh, John 17, 26. Jesus is praying to the Father. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me, the love, Father, with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. The love with which you loved me. That's the intra-Trinitarian love between the Father and the Son. And I'll tell you, it is not small or weak. It is infinite. God doesn't love His Son small. He loves His Son with energy and freedom and joy that puts all the forces of the galaxies to shame. That, he says, I pray, Father, will be in them. There will come a day, partly in this life, would that it were more, right? Would that I love God the way I should. I don't. There will come a day, for those of us who are born of God and follow Jesus, there will come a day when in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that will be granted in such fullness if we didn't have a new resurrection body, we would explode. You must have a spiritual body to manage the presence of the living God loving His Son with the energy with which He loves the Son. If you ever thought, but I, I came up in a broken family. My dad never rejoiced. He just barked out commands all the time. I can't even get to where you are. It's all right. Relax. He is so merciful. So patient. Every one of us is limping, right? Every one of us is crippled. There's not a whole person in this room. Emotionally crippled, physically crippled, mentally crippled. We're all crippled. Nobody's loving Jesus the way they should in this room. Nobody ever will love Jesus in this life the way you should. Some a little more broken than others. We're all in this together. The day is coming when the, the mustard seed that we have right now, the taste that we've received now, that little glimmer that we've seen now, we've given ourselves to it as much as we can get it, we've given ourselves to it, that's going to land on you with cataclysmic force. When you die and go to heaven, and then even more, when you are given your new body in the new heavens and the new earth. Well, I close. 
How is Christ magnified in verse 21? This is turning us to tomorrow's, t tomorrow's uh, talk now. How is he magnified? Whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What, what makes me tick is this. Over here, I'm told to make much of Christ in everything I do. And over here, I'm told that happens when I count Christ gain at the point of death. In other words, I'm required to so enjoy him that saying farewell to Noel after 39 years of marriage, farewell to Talitha before she gets married and I get to be a part of it, is no loss at all. That's how much I'm to enjoy him. You're called to be so radically happy in God that letting your happiest earthly experiences go will be called gain. The question is, how in the world do you become that kind of person? Let's pray. So Father, as we want to be the kind of person who will make you look that good, I pray that as we go to bed tonight, you'll be at work. Be mightily at work. And apply these things to our hearts. These are not just words, they're not just ideas, they are corresponding to realities. Holy Spirit, I plead with you in the name of Jesus that you'd come and magnify the Son. In his name I pray. Amen.